So I would like to start um, on this first panel of the SOAS Festival of Ideas, um, a week -long, a long series of events that will be exploring various themes and research areas at SOAS and particularly focused on the theme of decolonizing. So welcome um, to all those who have joined. Uh, the way this event uh, is being run, we are recording it. Uh, we have a wonderful list uh, of presenters uh, who will each be talking about their research themes. Uh, we have Dr. Maya Goodfellow, Sarah Walker, Pavin Pung, uh, Professor Laura Hammond, and Dr. Kaliango Sebba from Kampala, Uganda, joining us as well. And all of these uh, speakers will present their current research on refugees and migrants in the context of decolonizing knowledge, uh, as this is extremely important, especially because in the 20, first 20 years of the 21st century, we have seen more people displaced at, at any point in history. And it's particularly interesting uh, that in this panel, we'll be looking at the Horn of Africa, where currently over 14 million people uh, have been displaced in some way or another. So each presenter will have eight to 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, we'll open uh, the panel uh, with some reflections some questions. And we will also be sharing your questions and answer uh, questions. Um, so please direct these uh, at the Q&A uh, tab at the bottom of your Zoom win window. Uh, so it's the bottom uh, right. Uh, and I will be sharing those with the panelists uh, who will do, uh, who will obviously address these. Uh, and we expect the event will be uh, lasting around one hour and a half. So I think you're all ready uh, to hear this wonderful uh, lineup of speakers. And so I'll first uh, introduce Dr. Maya Goodfellow, a researcher, writer, journalist. Um, she's the author of Hostile Environment, How Immigrants Became Scapegoats, which has just recently been republished as a paperback uh, for Verso Books. Um, if you haven't read it, please do. And she is currently a Liverholm early career researcher at Sperry Sheffield University, where she works on issues related to race, capitalism, and abolition. So I'm going to pass over to Maya. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to um, Stephanie and others who have been sort of integral to putting together this whole series of events. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with a really great lineup of speakers um, and uh, I am going to, I guess it's somewhat narrowly but specifically focused on the popular debate in the UK around um, around immigration broadly and I'm going to try and specifically think about the role that race plays which is um, a large part of what my work is about um, and I'm going to try and do this by thinking about one of the main arguments um, that's made against immigration in popular discourse um, in the UK and then I'm going to try because we're living through these um, particularly terrible times I'm going to try and specifically think about what this debate but also what immigration enforcement in the UK means during a pandemic so how are people being impacted which is some of the work that I've been most recently been doing and I suppose the sort of starting things underlying everything that I'm going to say is really um, whether we're thinking about political debate media debate or actually in certain parts of scholarship particularly thinking about political science and mainstream migration literature often what we find is racialized conceptions of migration being reproduced um, that is thinking about the people who move um, are treated as sort of things to be studied, populations to be studied, as opposed to people, human beings. It seems like a sort of basic thing to say, but I think it is worth stating in that so much of the political debate, at least, is structured as um, migration being a problem to be dealt with, to be controlled and to be minimised. Um, and sort of the human, the humanity of all of this, of, of this, the whole discussion is often sidelined or treated as something that is relatively unimportant. Um, and I'm gonna, I suppose, 
um, adopt or contribute to what is a more critical vein of literature, in particular, which brings in thinking about the UK's immigration system, which brings race into analysis, but also brings the UK's history of empire into analysis. And so to date, a lot of the work that I've been doing is really um, drawing on and building on the work done by so many other people, which looks at the existing realities of the immigration system. So what does it mean to try and navigate the UK's immigration system? But in sort of in conjunction with that, what are the arguments made to justify some of these incredibly restrictive measures that we see? So what we know is that if you look back at the UK's history of immigration legislation, which I'm not, I don't have time to do, but what you, what you find is you find history of racism. So really from the 60s and 70s onwards, you find pieces of immigration legislation being passed through parliament, which um, are specifically focused on making it more difficult for people of colour coming from the colonies and former colonies to come to the UK. So Gaminda Bamba, who is based at Sussex, calls these policies not immigration policies, but policies of racialization, demarcating certain groups of people as um, less desirable, as people who need to be kept out, or as people who should only be able to stay within the country for a specific amount of time. Um, and if you fast forward to now, obviously a lot happens between from the 60s to now, but what you find is some of these racialized logics still in operation in, in um, the sets of policies that make up the hostile environment. And so we know from reams and reams of evidence that these are racially discriminatory policies and that these have racialized outcomes in terms of how people are being impacted. So I'll mention that at the end in terms of what the hostile environment, the ongoing hostile environment means for people during the pandemic. Um, but really thinking about the arguments that are used to justify these pieces of legislation and sort of justify these restrictive measures, I sort of um, understand them as, um, as we can conceptualize them in, in these two sort of broad overlapping categories, one being economic and the other being cultural. So the economic arguments, I'm not going to go into this idea that migration is bad for the UK economy, that people who migrate here are at once um, coming to take from the benefit system and also taking jobs from, um, uh, from people who are already in the country. I mean, I don't buy any of those arguments, but I think they're sort of well, they, they've been, we, we're quite familiar with them and none of them are factually accurate, but I think that's, we, maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A because I think the second set of arguments which overlap with those, the cultural, the so-called cultural arguments are ones that are much less talked about, much less um, dissected and understood, at least in mainstream political discourse, they just tend to be repeated. And so this is the argument that immigration is bad for British or English culture. And that is one of the reasons why it needs to be restrict restricted. And so in particular, we see this argument being made in from the 60s and 70s um, onwards. And they these arguments do find their roots in empire, but we find them being articulated more and more um, from the 60s and 70s by this sort of loose group of people who are called the new right and Enoch Powell was one person who sort of was in this sphere of um, of this group and what the this group do is in the 60s and 70s they reject scientific racism they say we do not think um, this is a group of white people they say we do not think we are racially superior to people of color coming from the colonies and former colonies but we are just culturally distinct and if we have too many immigrants of a certain kind coming from certain parts of the world then they will dilute english culture they dilute the bonds of solidarity that are necessary for things like the nhs and that is why these groups of people need to be restricted from coming to the uk and the reason why i think it's important to sort of hone in on this is these, the, these are arguments that we still see made now um, in the, they're sort of being refashioned in particular ways that people talk about the pace of change being too fast. They say they don't recognize the area around them um, or even during the um, height of the so-called refugee crisis in the summer of 2015, what you heard often was um, one of the arguments that was often made and still made is that people coming from certain parts of the world are a threat to European values. And this is an incredibly Islamophobic argument um, because it is direct, often directed to people who are seen to be or who are Muslims. And I don't have loads of time, so I can't go into all of the ways that this argument manifests because it comes up in all kinds of different, um, in different forms. But I think there's two things that we want to think about here in terms of thinking about where race and um, 
empire sort of featuring in this is one is we want to ask what culture is so how is culture even being defined in this formulation and it's worth thinking about a really good Stuart Hall quote which I'm now going to butcher which is um Stuart Hall writing about the the drink tea and he says what does anyone know about an English person except they can't get through the day without a cup of tea except there are no tea plantations in England where is tea grown in India, Ceylon, Sri Lanka, that is the outside history that is inside the history of the English. And when so when we're thinking about this idea of English or British culture, it's treated as if it is this bounded and static thing that's sort of endogenously produced within the UK. But actually what we know is that this is something that isn't static, that is constantly shifting, but that also that the if you buy there to be some kind of UK culture, which I think it's quite difficult to argue if you think about different people will imagine this in different ways, then it's quite difficult to suggest that it's sort of something that has only ever been produced within this like, bounded entity of the UK. Um, but the other point I think that is, is worth noting here in relation to this argument about culture is that this culture in a lot of ways is a proxy for race. So scholars at the time dubbed this the new racism. So it's worth noting that not all groups are seen as culturally incompatible with the UK. So one way of thinking about this is that when people talk about so-called illegal immigration as being a threat to the UK, they most likely are not thinking about, say, white Australians who have overstayed their, their, their visa, right? This is a racialized concept. Um, and this is really um, important for understanding the way that the debate manifests in the UK, because often it's argued that anti-immigration feeling is a natural reaction to too much immigration of a certain kind. So people naturally feel culture threatened and their culture is being threatened. But if we begin to think about how these things are constructed, how they're racialized and much like race, how this idea of culture is being constructed, is being fabricated, then I think it becomes much easier to unpick and make sense of these anti-immigration feeling this anti-immigration feeling, which is often used to justify incredibly restrictive policy. Um, but the one thing that I wanted to end on is really is where we are now. And so I'll just very quickly say that as well as being racialized, evidently the immigration system and the Im immigration discourses in the UK are classed. There is a class element to this. And we know this by purely by looking at the immigration rules as they stand at the moment. You have to earn a certain amount of money in order to be able to come to the UK. Um, you have to be able to afford to navigate this incredibly costly system. And it's worth thinking about how during the pandemic, during the height of the lockdown in the UK, one of the arguments that's been made is that there's been this sort of recognition that so-called key workers, people who were dismissed as low skilled, are actually incredibly important. And that many of these people are migrants have migrated to the UK from other countries. And this argument was really used to push back against the immigration health surcharge, which is a policy that means that people, according to their immigration status, have to pay twice over for the NHS. They pay in through their taxes and national insurance, like people who um, happen to be born in the UK, but then they also have this extra charge um, just, just because of where they were born. And there was a pushback against this during the lockdown related to this key work narrative saying actually a lot of these people are really really essential to the functioning of the of, of UK society doing incredibly important jobs that have often been seen as unimportant um, and so what happened is the government suspended the NHS they scrapped the NHS health surcharge but only for NHS and social care workers all other key workers still have to pay who are who are who have this um, condition attached to their uh, their visa they have to pay the surcharge, as does everyone else because of their immigration status. If it applies to you, you still have to pay. And so I think this really shows the problem with the contribution narrative that is so often underlying a lot of our debate, this idea that certain people can come to the UK if they contribute in the right way. What it does is it, it reinforces this really commoditized idea of who matters, who doesn't, who should be given rights and who doesn't. And so I suppose I'll just end by saying, I think this really shows what's happened during the pandemic and this really racialized history of um, who is subjected to immigration enforcement, who is seen as a threat and who is not, how, what this means for how people experience the immigration system and the, the, the bordering system that is um, not only at the borders in terms of going, moving through airports, but is in our public services. It really shows us that we, I think we need to sort of flip the narrative and stop focusing so much on the figure of the migrant and actually focus much more attention, as many do, but much more attention on popular debate too, on the damages done by borders, as opposed to thinking that borders are these things that keep us safe, and um, realizing that they're things that produce violence, produce precarity, and actually do an incredible amount of harm to a huge number of people. Um, so yeah, I, I suppose I'll just end with that, thinking that part of this is really about 
recentering what we're looking at and not only continuing to sort of reproduce these very racialized ideas of immigration, but beginning to focus more attention on the border. Thank you very much, Maya. Uh, great timing and I think a very good point to sort of conclude on. Um, so welcome to all those who've joined us while Maya is speaking. My name is Alea Forte, uh, teaching fellow at SOAS. I am chairing this panel. Um, can I ask you all to direct your questions to the Q&A tab at the bottom? So if you have any questions for Maya about um, the history, brief history she gave us of how migration has been racialized and uh, the racialization of the immigration system and the a role that culture plays in um, in the defense um, of borders, then please uh, start typing away. I will direct these at the panelists at the end of the session. So our next speaker is um, Sarah Walker. She has she's a researcher and practitioner in the refugee sector in London. Um, her PhD in sociology explores the productive nature of borders, so it's a nice continuation from where we left off. And she uh, examines in particular the interaction between migration regimes and uh, young African men who are bureaucratically labelled as unaccompanied minors. Uh, specifically in Italy. And she's also a research fellow on a project that examines the nexus between climate change and migration at the University of Bologna, which um, is very topical. So I'll pass over to Sarah Walker, who will uh, introduce her research to all of you. Thanks very much and thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, so this um, research that I'm going to present now is based on uh, my PhD, which I just recently finished. So I've tried to uh, summarise it. So I hope it's going to work and also focus um, predominantly on the underlying framework as relates to this um, panel. But um, I think it follows on nicely from what, what Maya was saying, because I look specifically about the productivity of borders and in particular looking at unaccompanied minors in Italy and um, how these young men, I focus only on men, are portrayed as threats. And yet I look at how uh, the border policies uh, create harm uh, to them. So I'm gonna uh, share the screen and hopefully this will work. Um, okay, yeah. So um, it looks at young African migrants, I've called them migrants, uh, using the terminology as a neutral term, uh, not encompassing any kind of uh, false binary between uh, voluntary and forced, uh, turning 18 in Italy, or the border work of childhood and race in the European migration regime. And um, I want to just start with the, this drawing, which was done by one of my participants, Amadou, who was 18 at the time. He's from the Gambia and came to Italy as a 16 year old, as an unaccompanied minor to seek asylum. Because um, this drawing encompasses um, many elements of, of my research, not least the visual elements and the um, perspectives and counter narratives of the young men I spoke to. So he described this picture, he shared it with me. Um, as the perfect picture, it's the perfect picture of illegal immigrants, and he laughs at this term, as they use us in everything, we carry the boat with the machines and everything fixed, so heavy, so difficult, you have to drag it to the sea. And this is a picture of him and other young men um, carrying a boat from Libya to cross the sea to Italy. Um, and this picture reveals his experiences in the politics of abandonment of European migration policies and the importance of the sea, as I'll go on to discuss. But his drawing also does more than capture the helpless victims on boats, which are so often portrayed in the media, usually an image taken from above, showing packed bodies in overcrowded small vessels bobbing helplessly in the sea. His drawing is from the other side. It reverses this image and shows the agency and complicity of those about to embark on the journey as well as the way in which they used at every stage. And the boat, this small boat held over their heads is at once a talisman of hope and a weight and a burden. And this provides a different sense of the constitutive relationship between the border regime and its outsiders as foregrounded by the sea, as I'll explain um, shortly. So my research problematizes the crisis narrative as many others have done uh, of um, 
the migration crisis so-called in, in Europe through historicizing migration and revealing how this narrative masks policies of deterrence and harm, as Myers alluded to, which negatively impact, in this case, unaccompanied minors uh, in Italy, particularly as they grow up uh, and become adults. So I want to compare with them um, this next picture, which I found on Pinterest, uh, which refers to Italian settlers as opposed to migrants in Libya, uh, so Libya was once an Italian colony from 1910 to 1947. And this quote here from Ian Chambers asks us to attend to the accumulation of memories of migration that make up the Mediterranean and reminds us that in Libya in the 1930s, some 13% of the population was made up of Italians. Today, the Mediterranean is traversed in the opposite direction by those coming from Africa and Asia looking for a better life. Um, so through focusing on these historical uh, linkages between the two countries, we can see how this influences the construct of the other and the way in which problems caused to the young men uh, in my study derive from the structural inequalities and raced landscape of the geopolitical terrain in which European interests and histories still shape the lives of post-colonial subjects today. It also shows the position of Italians as migrants and subalterns. So more recent scholarship has shown how the militarization of EU borders further empowered militias involved in fueled weapon and human smuggling in Libya, boosting a brutal system of detention and forced labor that both traps migrants in Libya and pushes them towards Europe. As Pradell and Chilo said, this ongoing racial climate crosses boundaries from the global south to the north as colonialism. Um, so instead, if we do as Helen and Pezzani uh, suggest and view the world from the sea, we can see how unruly freedom of human mobility, far from being an anomaly, has been a constant throughout history and persists in spite of the multifarious practices that try to tame it. In fact, as legal channels into Europe are ever more restricted, making the dangerous crossing over the Mediterranean Sea increasingly becoming the only alternative for those seeking a better life. Indeed, following the creation of the European Union, the legal movement of people between North Africa and Europe with seasonal labour status was curtailed. Yet despite the risk of death, people still come. And there is a lot of evidence that border controls are simply rerouting people to more dangerous channels. So then I want to show this other drawing that uh, Amadou shared with me in which he re represents himself as a wrestler. And he says, I don't feel like an immigrant. I feel like someone who's living his life, who has the right to see the world. And let's say the rest are just respects dignity and power and respect. Um, so again, this is a, a focus on rights and the right to see the world and how these rights are um, detracted from the young men in my study through border controls. Um, so building on the critique of the crisis narrative and focusing on counter narratives such as that of Amadou, I utilize the framework in my research of the black Mediterranean, which is a term coined by Alessandra Di Maio so using this framework brings to light the colonial connections between past and present, and it visualizes histories and connections between Italy and Europe and Africa, and histories that are ignored in the politics of abandonment and crisis narratives. It further recognizes that just as the expulsion and enslavement that characterized the Black Atlantic were crucial to modern capitalism, as Paul Gilroy has shown, so present day migration is related to European geopolitical interests. It focuses further on the sea as a site of human rights violation and the obscuring of violence. Um, so the research that I focus on is uh, framed within the Black Mediterranean um, notion, and I focus particularly on uh, young men such as Amadou um, arriving and being labelled uh, unaccompanied minors, and how uh, their transition to adulthood uh, encompasses the intersection of childhood and race. So I conducted an ethnography of a reception centre in northern Italy and focused in on 12 young African migrants or male. Um, and I consider the interaction between migration regimes and unaccompanied minors to explore the productive nature of borders. So it looks at the lived experience of the uh, transition to adulthood and the intersection of the border of childhood and race. Um, so I'm not going to go into the legal elements because I don't have time, it's very complicated, but essentially, you may well know, a lot of child migrants are receive temporalised hospitality until the age of 18, 
on the basis of their child status, after which most EU member states return them as adults or they lose all their rights to accommodation and protection. Um, Italy, however, at least in theory, is uh, different, um, but I'm not going to go into detail here. Um, so uh, the research contends that unaccompanied minors is a construct deriving from the intersection of the sedentary perspective of Europe's migration policies and the idealised Western construct of the cult of childhood. So age then emerges as a biographical border, as Nick Meyer has identified the division between protection and deportation. Um, so my research looks at what happens after the unaccompanied minor who's actually managed to survive the perilous journey across land and sea and made it to Europe turns 18 and is legally considered adult. And what happens after uh, they cross the protective threshold of childhood. Uh, so just some findings really briefly. Um, uh, again, uh, really important as, as Maya drew attention, the racialization of the migrant um, and using this transition as a lens can show how the transformation from the vulnerable deserving child to the folk devil undeserving adult. It also illuminates the false morality of the temporalized hospitality for the child and in doing so foregrounds race in the migration discourse. It reveals how racialized discourses in the normative construction of good childhood intersect in the construction of the unaccompanied minor. Um, and it also shows the complexities of these young men as they negotiate and contest the vulnerabilized subject of the minor, wrestling with the regime to keep hold of hope for their better future. It further identifies the harm done to these young men via the migration regime rather than vice versa. And it reveals the fallacy then of this protective state of Europe in the ongoing processes of subordination and exclusion faced by the young men in my study, particularly as they transition to adulthood. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, very much. Um, someone uh, has asked if uh, they could possibly have access to these slides although I would like to sort of remind everybody the event is being recorded, so you can probably re-watch, take screenshots of these, but um, we'll discuss this afterwards with the, um, um, with the panelists. Um, so if you have any other questions, particularly on the discussions, uh, topics that are being uh, introduced, uh, as in Sarah's case, you know, uh, getting us to think about vulnerability, particularly immigration systems. Uh, please do direct your uh, questions to the Q&A tab. Um, and uh, we will be now moving to Pavim Fung, who is a Cambodian doctoral researcher in visual sociology and also an artist. Um, she has exhibited her artworks in Cambodia. Uh, she's mostly used acrylics as a medium uh, to unpack the topic of gender inequality uh, in Cambodia. But at the moment, uh, she is researching for her PhD, um, which actually uses mixed me methods uh, to understand the experience of marriage migrants and what they're going through in the visa application process in the UK. So um, I'll pass over to Pavin. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to try to share screen. Hopefully it works. Or not. Oops, sorry. Um, this one. Um, there you go. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. So uh, my name is Praveen and I'm a PhD candidate at Cosmic University of London, and uh, I'm researching marriage migration. Um, so today, I kind of want to explore the question of what makes someone uh, a migrant, particularly what makes someone um, a marriage migrant. So um, marriage migrant is a bureaucratic term. Migrate on the basis of marriage or civil partnership. So marriage migration is a topic not often talked about. However, uh, there's currently an increasing volume of uh, literature and research um, on this topic. But is often the discussion 
uh, on marriage migration kind of center on its rules and requirements. So for example, the minimum income requirements uh, of 18,600 pounds a year that the British partner needs to have in order to sponsor their non-EU um, partner to come to the UK. So there have been a lot written on the requirements, but today I kind of want to shift our focus slightly to the question of what makes uh, a marriage migrant, particularly on the social technical arrangements that comes to enact a marriage migrant. To do that, I propose that we pay close attention to a particular object, a bureaucratic object, uh, which is so let's just first look at what is a spousal visa application form. So it's a form, uh, it's an it's a official form, and it is for a non-EU partner and is completed in order to gain entrance into a particular country, in this case, the UK, to live with their British partner or to remain in the country as a partner of a British citizen. So it is an official document and it exists online. It used to uh, be like a physical form where you download and you fill it. But now uh, in order to fill this form, you have to uh, go online to do that. So the study of a visa application form hardly occupies center stage in immigration uh, control analysis, despite the fact that we encounter bureaucratic form everywhere. So um, it's, almost impossible to go on your daily life without filling any form. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a marriage migrant or a migrant, you always have to fill form. You have to fill form, your visa form, in order to obtain your visa to come into uh, the UK. So it's unavoidable to face, to have to encounter this um, um, bureaucratic forms. So the studying of uh, application forms as materiali uh, materializations of border technology is part of an attempt to kind of move uh, from border, border spectacle that fixates on a kind of ritualized display of violent expulsion to administrative bordering that is no less violent. An application form as part of administrative bordering is where policy and law and ideology and um, mobility management is materialized. And uh, it can also be argued that uh, people experience policy through forms and paperwork and interaction with uh, street level bureaucrats. So administrative bordering allow us to kind of examine law in action. So when we look at the visa application form, I take that as a, a device, but this device doesn't kind of just exist in isolation. So it mobilizes a, like a cascade of other actors and devices. So for example, this form work with a biometric machine, uh, professionals such as solicitors, immigrant officials, and with IT systems. So it works together as a network. So in this case, I adopt Rupert's definition of device as involving um, kind of specific arrangements of humans and technologies. But rather than simply representing the migrant, devices such as uh, forms also enact subjects. Right? So to put it differently, so to collect, store, or retrieve, analyze, and present data through various methods means to bring those object and subject that data speak of into being. So to bring that to the form, in order to fill the form, we need to translate the messiness of our intimate life to fit the template of the form. So the form is not a neutral piece of paper simply asking questions. The form is regulated and governed by other policies and by the government attitudes and values on migrants. So for this particular form, it gov is governed by the British value on what a proper and legitimate family should be. So these are some of the questions on the form. Um, the form is very long, but uh, I extracted some of the questions on it um, to put it here. 
So for example, as you can see, there's a number of ideas and belief about romance and relationship that are folded onto this form. So the question is about whether uh, the couple is monogamous or if the marriage is arranged or if the applicant is related to their partner. So as you can see, the questions are written uh, to target a particular audience such as South Asians. So romance also needs to be translated into a certain uh, concrete form. So for example, providing um, applicants have to provide marriage certificates, wedding photographs, and romance also need to be translated into a certain narrative that could be understood by the British culture. So for example, romance oftentimes to be based on individual choice and true love and shouldn't be arranged. So for same-sex couple who are engaging in this visa process, they will be asked to present their relationship akin to marriage, meaning their union still needs to be molded into the married couple model. So although the basis of this uh, migration is on a particular type of marriage or relationship, money and income take uh, make up most uh, a big part of it. So. For example, it is it, very common because the UK political rhetoric is kind of occupied with the image of a hardworking family and the needs to do away with dependence in all its forms, which include uh, financial dependence on the state. So the form, oops, sorry. Um, so, the form function as some sort of interpretive schema that is given coherence to the messiness of the social and intimate life. The couple is responsible for producing official documents, or official accounts of their relationship that fit into a provided structure and categories, or as law argue, the couples need to enact two versions of reality, the official and the local at the same time. This is because in dealing with the form, we usually do not have a say in what information is to be extracted from us. But these different types of information could be assemble and reassemble to produce a marriage migrant. So this form also brings forward a figure of a sponsor who is the British citizen. It brings forward uh, a marriage migrant, a migrant who is monogamous, belong to a nuclear family grounded in marriage, is in a relationship based on individual choice as opposed to influenced by immigration benefits and is economically independent. So I kind of want to finish this uh, talk by asking not what makes someone a marriage migrant, since we kind of talk touch on that a little bit, but why should we look into these practices that make marriage migrants? So why do we need to look into the form or the, um, the processes, the application processes? And that's because by looking into the ways in which um, this group is uh, produced, we can see how not just marriage migrants, but migrants or refugees are not a pre-existing group, always there and ready for uh, identification, but is enacted. They are being produced through these practices and they are being enacted vis-a-vis uh, -vis the technology. So I think that is a is a important kind of concept to, to hold on to when we talked about, when we have immigration debate is that there is no pre-existing group, there is no, um, you know, migrant is being made, is being produced through these practices. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's all I have. And I'll be happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you so much, Paveen. That is so interesting and so many questions already sort of coming to mind. So I hope the audience has them as well. Um, so far, we've uh, been introduced to three uh, different but interlinking research projects uh, on refugees and migrants um, that are trying to research these themes in the context of decolonizing knowledge. Um, all of them have sort of questioned uh, how the system decides who matters, who doesn't, who is vulnerable, who isn't, and 
also who constitutes a family, but they've all been done in the context of Britain and uh, Europe, uh, specifically Italy. So our next two speakers um, will be instead taking us um, outside of um, Europe, and we will be starting with Professor Laura uh, Hammond, who teaches development studies at SOAS, uh, who will be introducing her um, new research project, Migration and Displacement in the Horn of Africa. Um, she's leading a team, uh, the Research and Evidence Facility uh, team, which looks at questions of displacement. Um, and so I think she is the best person to introduce this project. So I'll pass over to Professor Laura Hammond. Great, thank you very much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be on this on this panel and to hear about this great work that's going on. Um, as as uh, Elijah just said, I'm going to shift us to geographically shift us, but I think we're creating a kind of narrative here that um, that in which you'll see that the different presentations kind of speak to each other because we're all sort of coming at a similar set of issues uh, from different perspectives, but in I think some similar ways. So I wanted to just outline to you some work that I've been involved with. Actually, um, it's not new, it's been, it's been going on for the last four years, uh, which is um, a research consortium called the Research and Evidence Facility. And we are um, made, led, I, I'm based at SOAS, I'm the team leader. Um, it's a consortium made up of SOAS, the University of Manchester and Sahan Research, which is a um, sort of think tank based in Nairobi. And, um, we are a team of about six uh, kind of core members. And as I'll discuss later on, we work with a network of now um, over 50 researchers from the region. And that's a really important part of what we do. Um, we're funded by the European Union and we were tasked by the EU to, um, as part of the uh, EU trust fund for, for Africa to think about the, the broader context in which migration is happening. And we've kind of taken that and run with it. And perhaps we've run with it in um, directions that uh, go beyond what our funders ever envisioned. Um, but I think that the, the ways we've taken it uh, really speak to um, the, the themes that we're talking about today. So one of our interests in taking this on, uh, basically, uh, first I should say that our mandate <clears throat> is to look at migration, mobility, displacement within the Horn of Africa. So of course, this was occasioned by the interest post-2015 with trying to understand the drivers of migration towards Europe. And the funding that came available for the EU Trust Fund was from EU members, some of whom uh, had a real ad in, were really interested in trying to find ways of minimizing migration to Europe. However, other states within the 28 member states were very much aware that there were other stories going on, there are other things happening, and that actually um, movements towards Europe was just a tip of the iceberg of the wider set of issues around people's movement within the region, within the Horn of Africa region, by which I define nine countries from Eritrea in the north to Tanzania in the south, including both Sudans, Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, et cetera. Um, and, uh, but, but there's a lot of mobility that's going on that's not well understood. And if we just look at mobility as a story about people moving to Europe, then we're missing out on a whole range of other things that are going on. So, so we've taken that uh, as a starting point and we've tried to understand what are these other different dynamics. We, don't, <clears throat> we haven't really, for the most part, looked much at people moving from the Horn of Africa to Europe. Um, we have a little bit in terms of intentions. We did one study with our research associate, uh, Susanna Jaspers, which looked at Starfouri. Sudanese um, migrants and refugees moving towards Europe, but for the most part, we focused on what happens in the region. And there you have a wider, huge number, as the point was made, it's 14 million people who are estimated to be displaced within the region. And then within that, an even wider set of people who are on the move, who are not necessarily displaced, but are moving for per perhaps for other reasons or a mix of different reasons. Um, and so our research has really been focused on that. And what we are is not a research project per se, but more a, um, a, a kind of research, but as a, a consortium that really aims at 
um, uh, having multiple projects. So we've done work on rural to urban migration. We've done work on refugee hosting. We've done work on uh, environmental migration, displacement, whatever you want to call it, on youth employment um, as a, as a you know, what, what difference does youth employment make to people's ideas about wanting to be on the move or not, whole range of things. And so we've, we're kind of amassing this, this body of evidence um, through these multiple studies. And now we're starting to look across the studies to see what does this tell us about um, migration, mobility, displacement, what does it tell us about development policy? What does it tell us about um, migration policy more generally? Um, and, and trying to feed that to our so-called, you know, our client, our funder, which is the EU, but also broadly. So in that process, I am thinking about this whole theme of decolonization and um, the, you know, what does decolonization mean in the context of doing this kind of research? I wanted to focus on a few different types of ways of understanding that. The first is to try to decolonize, in a sense, the narrative or the, the myth that migration, the migration crisis, if you like, if you think of it as a crisis, and I don't, and that will be one of my second myths, but myths that we want to bust. But if you think about people on the move, that the story is uh, of story of people moving towards Europe is only a very is a piece of that. Uh, it's an important piece, absolutely. And as as has already been said today, um, it really shines a very strong light into some of the presuppositions, biases, uh, forms of racism, forms of exclusion that are existing in the societies in which many of us gathered today are living in. But it's only a piece, and there's there are other pieces of that that we need to understand more broadly. We need to understand why people move, under what conditions they move, what their experience of moving is. And, and, a, and, and how to respond to that best. Is it a problem? Is it not a problem? So that's my second issue, is that for the most part, migration has been cast very much as a problematic, um, a, a sort of crisis that needs to be solved, that people on the move have been at best inconvenient and at most threatening, deeply problematic. We can see this in the current COVID crisis that um, there's a huge amount of distrust, th uh, hostility, um, centered towards people who move because they're seen as being public health threats or you know disease carriers when in fact they're, they're the only thing they're doing is moving from one place to another they may be doing so without protection um, but the fact of their movement is not the problem it's the lack of protection that is the problem so our second kind of um, motive in the research that the REF does, which we call the REF, uh, is to think about um, ways of understanding migration as not being problematic. That, that in a sense, we try to kind of narrow down um, the kind of movement which is unsafe or forced and say, well, that's problematic, obviously. We don't want to, you know, we need to try to find ways of assisting people, of help providing greater protection to people who are on the move because they're forced to or without any choice. And sometimes that's, that um, criterion or that kind of uh, definition becomes hard to determine. So sometimes people might move uh, out of for, for economic aspirations, for study aspirations, but along the journey, they become subject to smuggling and trafficking uh, networks, um, to abuse, and they become forced migrants but through the journey. So there are problems with trying to figure out who we're, who we're actually talking about, but a great a huge percentage of movement is not necessarily problematic. It's what people do. It's, it's what people uh, engage in to try to maximize their opportunities, to take advantage of, uh, of you know, opportunities that they see or to live out their dreams, to reunite with their loved ones, whatever it is. And so those, um, those aspects of mobility are really not problematic. And what is problematic is that very often development and humanitarian frameworks get in the way of that movement. They try to block people. They try to lock them in place to say, you must be situated in one location in order to be served, in order to be assisted or protected. Um, borders are closed, refugee camps are closed. People are not allowed to move without documentation. This is a story that we've seen in the previous presentations in terms of movement into and within Europe, but it's also happening in places like the Horn of Africa. And so we're really trying to 
sort of decolonize in a sense that whole concept of migration as being problematic and this kind of scapegoating of the migrant, which leads to all sorts of other really problematic kind of um, sort of dehumanizing processes. So trying to look at the positive aspects of movement, trying to understand and unpick those narratives of power that are responsible for constructing such a narrative in the first place. In some senses, we're trying to as well advise development policy of about how to build mobility uh, and considerations and protections of mobility of, of you know sort of positive mobility into their understanding of how development should be practiced. It shouldn't be seen migration shouldn't be seen as an aberration, a thing people do as an exception to the rule, if you like, but it should be a core practice that many livelihoods are dependent upon, and and sort of recenter our own development frameworks to follow. The real practices that people are engaging in, which we can see involves, in many, many cases, involves mobility. Um, just checking my time here, which is hard to see. Um, the, the other thing that is really important about this project is that we are working with a whole range of amazing talent from within uh, the Horn of Africa. And I'll just sort of pick on that topic briefly, and then I'm going to pass over to my colleague, um, Kariango Ronald Seba, who is, has been one of our colleagues throughout the last four years and who I've worked with for more than 20 years, I think, um, who can explain a bit more what that looks like from his perspective. But we are a small team, a really small team of, of um, kind of core researchers. And what we do, the way that we work is try to be as collaborative as possible in reaching out to independent researchers, to universities, to think tanks, uh, to teams of people in all of the different countries where we work to have them carry on the research, sometimes together with us, sometimes on their own, to try to provide lots of opportunities for their own writing and their advocacy to shine through. So sometimes they're you know, attending meetings and talking about the research that they're doing and we're helping to facilitate that. And what our, our ultimate goal is to try to be a catalyst for the researchers who are working in the region, but very often are not joined up with each other um, and haven't got the platforms to get the policymakers and the kind of audiences that they would like to reach to take note of the work they're doing. And so we think that our own, um, our own kind of research and evidence uh, platform can do that in a variety of different ways. So we really have worked very strongly at trying to um, get that work out there and um, to try to enable some of that, that work and, and the idea, the hope is that it creates a sustainable kind of um, legacy for the project that will continue to see a really vibrant community uh, of researchers within the region. It's not to, at all to say that we've created that, that um, platform, but that we hopefully we've you know, played an important role in making that happen. So I think that one, just to finish up the final thing to say about work like this, about projects and, and consortia like these, are that we have a huge amount of work to do at trying to decolonize the research process itself, at trying to really engage on a much more equitable basis with the communities that we are researching, for sure, but also with the researchers that we are working with in places, whether they're you know, in Africa or in the UK or in Europe um, to try to uh, level those inequalities, to try to understand where those inequalities come from um, and to do research in a different way. And so I think, I hope that it's really um, it's taken forward that an important part of so-called decolonizing the curriculum is also about decolonizing research and thinking about what role we all as researchers have to play in that process. I'll finish it there, thanks. Thank you, Laura. Um, and so now we move on to our last uh, panelist and speaker, and it is with extreme pleasure that we welcome Dr. Kaliango Ronald Seba. Um, we are very happy to have him here. He's um, um, 
is uh, joining us from Kampala, Uganda. He's a lecturer in the School of Women and Gender Studies and the Department of Social Work and Social Administration at Makarere University. Um, he uh, has a PhD and his topic was on returning uh, home, gender and choice among internally displaced persons in Gulu District, Northern Uganda. But he's joining us here to talk about this collaboration uh, with Laura and um, also, uh, yeah, his specific focus in it. So I'll pass over to you, Ronald. Um, th thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Alaya, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to talk after Laura, and uh, thank God we, ha we had to share, to change places. Um, but uh, I'm from Makerere Research Projects and Activities. Uh, one of them is decolonizing peace education, uh, the recent one that we are working on. Uh, I'm also in that is focusing on uh, coming up with a regional agenda on uh, uh, on forced displacement within the region. So allow me to share my screen. I just uh, I have just a few notes to share, and then I'll be done. Um, uh, what what I would like to do here is basically to have a few reflections uh, on the research and evidence facility from the Ugandan perspective of from my engagement. Uh, with what Laura has basically discussed. And uh, the RAFE in the region has largely considered rural to urban migration, environmental induced movement, refugees, displaced persons, and as well as cross-border mobility. And as she rightly mentions, these are issues that are at the center of our discourse on migration and mobility within the region and not necessarily uh, individuals moving across borders to other countries, among others. And, uh, and in so doing, uh, it has drawn our attention to how local, national, regional, and international processes influence our understanding of human mobility by taking a broader focus of the processes and the happenings within their migration world. It helps us to see how these processes are interlinked how they work together or work against each other, among others. Uh, for instance, uh, it has brought to light how migration, either voluntarily or involuntarily, is interlinked and is impacted by national, regional, and global policies aimed at migration management. Uh, if you look at uh, in the in the 1980s and the 90s, we always talked about fortress Europe. Or, and whereby there was there are always barriers for people coming in, and the always the barriers are always set very 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 high to hinder people from entering Europe. And uh, from our perspective, getting a visa to either Europe or the Americas uh, is always considered as a, a great achievement. And sometimes one may ask you, why did you ever go and never come back? You should have stayed maybe. But basically, because of the the impact of their national and uh, policies that are aimed at migration management, which not necessarily do not take into consideration why people move, how they move, and how they view or how how or take into consideration their own agency in terms of in, in such movements. Um, uh, participation with the RIF also brings to uh, to light the recognition of the role of regional organizations. Uh, especially in the issue, on the issue of mobility within the region and also beyond the region. And here in particular, we are talking about intra-regional mobility. And the importance of intra-regional mobility, I think, has been brought to the fore by the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic globally, whereby we are, only, we are not only looking at people moving from other countries into our countries, but we're also looking at uh, mobility, people moving within the borders uh, or within the regional borders, either for trade or for family reunifications or for marriages, 
or for uh, just visits or for education or for health or for a variety of reasons. So uh, in looking at this, we see that uh, intra-regional mobility also brings into the whole question of translocality, where we look at mobility, migration, circulation, and spatial interconnectedness by people, whereby where because of uh, immobility, you're cutting off remittances to people, you're cutting off job opportunities, among others. So you find that that, that interconnectedness is also disrupted because somebody who stayed home is not receiving what they would have received because somebody elsewhere is not able to be able to send in what they would have sent in for the survival of that particular individual. So in other words, uh, what you also see is how international and regional approaches to migration uh, largely remain ineffective without an appreciation of the socio-economic dimensions of the factors that drive mobility in the region. Uh, I like the presentation on marriage migrations. And if you look, if you're looking at marriage migrations, for instance, it brings out the issue that you cannot appreciate the romance between individuals. It has to be structured in a particular way. So also in our case, how international and regional approaches in a way tend to structure migration, but they remain ineffective in that uh, by not taking into consideration why people are moving, it becomes very difficult. For instance, in, our, in, in the, some of the studies we've participated in like rural to urban migration, there is evidence to show that people will always move to areas of opportunity and not necessarily to a given destination. So what drives mobility is not so much about uh, where am I going, but where is the opportunity? Is the opportunity in the immediate neighborhood or is it immediately across the borders? We've had uh, nationals or whole, uh, from Uganda going to South Sudan to work, basically because they have been invited to work in South Sudan because there were opportunities there. And sometimes it's not, it's not, it will not have been their right destination to go to, if they had really wanted, but because there was opportunity, people are able to move to that next destination. Uh, then uh, secondly, uh, the evidence also shows that in rural to urban migration research, uh, it brought to the fore the primacy of the concept of population mixing or mingling. Uh, this study was carried out in three cities. We had Gulu, Eldoret, and Dilidawa in Ethiopia. But one key aspect uh, or one key connecting factor for all these issues was the population mixing. People coming together and living together, working together, and then from different walks of life, and then they always come and meet in the, in the cities to work together and live together. So, and this issue now has uh, also been brought to the fore by the COVID-19 because we're also talking about populations mixing in closed spaces. And sometimes uh, they're, sh they're sharing accommodation, they're sharing transport, they're sh sharing sanitation facilities, they face issues of living in uh, either the slum areas or in the well-to-do areas among others because, uh, because of uh, how they come together and how they live together. And sometimes it also determines how they either participate or do not participate within the ongoings of the uh, the countries' uh, measures to prevent uh, the, uh, the COVID-19. Uh, then the other one uh, was basically translocality, which I, I think I've already alluded to, and I will not uh, waste much time on that. Um, when we look at the RAF and the decolonization agenda, uh, in decolonization, one of the issues has been decolonizing research. It has also been about decolonizing the curriculum. My take here is basically on uh, the ways uh, you transform or the ways the processes of knowledge production can be transformed. Uh, one thing uh, participation in the REF has done, like uh, Laura alluded to, was creating space for African migration scholars, not only to come together, but to also start a conversation amongst themselves. Uh, quite often in migration studies, we have always participated in uh, conversations but not between the African scholars, it was always between the European or the American and then the African scholars. And we always met each other in conferences among other places and then say, okay, here we are now, how can we start a conversation amongst ourselves? 
So through the, uh, through the RIP, at least we've been able to see uh, how those conversations have resulted into uh, joint projects outside even the RIP agenda or the EU agenda. And then we start talking amongst ourselves about issues that, that pertain to our own environments. Uh, secondly, uh, in the decolon decolonization agenda, we have also seen extended boundaries to an appreciation of how global and regional as well as processes are interlinked to influence human mobility. Uh, migration. Uh, I used to have a very narrow focus to Uganda and uh, issues pertaining to Uganda and how it deals with the questions of migration. And then I would study about Tanzania and how they're dealing with the issues of migration, among others. But when you, when you take the discourse to a regional level and a global level, then you begin to learn and appreciate how these are interlinked and why it is important not only to think locally, but also to, to think globally and also to think in terms of how uh, migration is interrelated across the borders. Uh, then the other aspect uh, about the decolonization agenda has always been the question of capacity building versus capacity sharing. Uh, quite often, uh, especially on the African continent, we, we, are, we are always promised to come and build our capacities. But uh, under the RIF, I think uh, also something I've seen with the, the decolonizing peace education project that I'm currently working with is that there is more of capacity sharing, recognizing what the African scholars bring on the table for research and also recognizing the differences and the similarities, uh, the differences in uh, abilities to write in grants and grants raising expertise um, among others. So you find that by working hand side by side, uh, there is not only a building of confidence, but there is also a, a better articulation of issues that arise as a consequence of the environment that we are surrounded with. And also to start to look at a, a kind of bottom-up process, looking at the problems that pertain to our own countries, not necessarily and then to be able to set our own research agenda. Uh, that's why I find that when the EU sets a research agenda of migrations to Europe, then it gives us an opportunity to also look at what are the issues that pertain to us within our, within our own context to be able to uh, address them in a better way or in a much more coordinated manner. So lastly, but not least, uh, raises the question of uh, how to build a visible research hub, for instance, bring together the African the Northern Scholars in such a, in, in a continuous or in a sustainable way to uh, what the Northern countries are, would realize within our own regions and maybe developments to be uh, to find a solution on how to address some of these things. Uh, thank you so much. I'll, I'll end it there for now. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation, which actually um, also concludes um, on a, a very important point about how build it, how to build collaboration, how to decolonize knowledge, and uh, yes, promote a more. Uh, I wouldn't word use the word inclusive, but um, a, a much broader and um, mixed um, uh, uh, research. Um, so we already have a few questions from the audience, um, which we can start uh, sharing with the panelists. Um, I guess the way this will work is um, if there's a general question, you can share your videos uh, and unmute if you want to speak. Um, and also use this uh, first introductory space if you want to also raise points with each other, because I think the, uh, all the presentation, all these research projects talk to each other as well. So it might be nice to have a conversation between panelists too. Uh, but there was one last question, um, which was directed to Professor Laura Hammond, but I guess it could be addressed to all 
the presenters on this panel, and that is um, to sort of expand a little bit more on the decolonizing of our research uh, methods. Um, and also sort of that links to the theme of this panel, um, which is really to think about and give examples through your research projects of how we can think, teach, discuss uh, migration, issues around migration and refugees in a decolonized context. Um, so I guess uh, I'll pass over to you and maybe we can um, sort of start with uh, Laura, uh, moving on to uh, Ronald, uh, Pawan, uh, Sarah and Maya. Great, thanks. I'll be brief. I mean, I think that I think that question was probably posted right before um, Kaliango gave his his talk because I think he gave some great examples of how uh, what happens when research is not decolonized and and how what some of the ways are that, that we're trying to address those inequalities. But just to say, if you think about research processes um, from just from the very moment of a researcher, whether it's a PhD researcher or a grant recipient, a senior career person, it doesn't really matter. Um, the ways that we go about doing this research, we talk about my project, we you know, set up a design, hope, and, and in, I'm talking about kind of in a caricatured format, but the, typically the ways that, that research design and implementation and um, uh, dissemination, write up, all of that publishing has been done, has been by a single person who's in charge of a research uh, endeavor. And, um, and very often that research, as we know, is not carried out by a single person, but there are translators, fixers, research assistants, uh, senior researcher colleagues in what, wherever they may be, who are also playing a role in this research. And they very often don't get given um, credit recognition, but they're also just very often not involved in the whole process. So they might be involved just in data collection. This is the typical kind of mistake that's made is that, you know, you hire co collaborators in whatever country you're working in and they implement the research uh, questionnaire that you and maybe some others have come up with um, and feed the data back. They often don't have control over, don't have access to even that data once they've gathered it. Um, they're not able to use it in their own research. The writing pieces of writing that are, come out of that very often don't include their names, or if they do, they're just as a sort of thank you at the end or in the acknowledgments. So there's just a whole load of ways in which and, and, the, and the, inequ the inequality over and over again. And unless we think very clearly about how the research process does replicate those inequalities, we're just going to continue to do it. So, and it takes not just researchers thinking about it, it takes research funders, it takes universities, it even, it takes collaborators as well who are used to being dealt with in a particular way and who don't ask or demand more. So uh, I, it takes a kind of revolution in the way that research is going on. But those are the kinds of things that I was thinking of when I said decolonize research. And I think that Kalyango's examples of the ways in which that's starting to change, hopefully, um, uh, bears, you know, uh, offer a glimmer of hope that we might be starting to, to reorient things. Um, Kaliango, would you like to add something? Um, yes, I'll, I'll, I think I'll, I'll add very, very briefly. Um, I think just like uh, Laura has said, uh, it's a process. It takes for us to unlearn some of the things that you have known for a long time and to implement them in a better way. But uh, just uh, uh, in relation to the presentation, beyond that, uh, in the current project, we are involved in decolonizing peace education. Uh, one of the things uh, we are doing is to, to, to listen to the to the voices of the people that we are working with, which, which, which also has uh, forced us to kind of a way change the methodologies that have been known to within the social sciences to integrate the arts-based methodologies, such as storytelling, uh, photo voice, among others, to, to give uh, much voice to the people that we are researching and that we are working with and to have, give them an ownership of the kind of research that they are 
uh, presenting and participating in, and then they feel like it, which also empowers them that their voices are heard and then uh, their issues can be addressed and then they can be confident and comfortable uh, tomorrow to be able to participate in future studies and other uh, researches. So I think just briefly, it is also about um, uh, knowledge sharing, uh, accepting capacity uh, of the African scholars, for instance, and also working very, very closely with those that uh, uh, taking part and also working together with all others that are involved in such a way that it's not just to look at I'm superior and you are junior, but we are all more, all more or less at the same level and everybody has something to contribute to the table. I think that's one of the key issues that has been missing in some of the, what I would call the colon, colonially best researches. Like uh, Laura says, do the data collection, shall do the writing. But here we see that there is a more blended uh, writing and sharing of skills and then in that way you have a more a more a more gen no. I think we may have lost the connection um uh, Pavin, would you like to go next? Um, yeah, I don't have much to add on, but, um, oh, sorry, my connection is pretty bad. <laughs> but um, I, we were like talking about decolonizing uh, research method. I, I think the, the traditional way of doing research is that we have an outsider going in doing research on this community. And it makes me think about certain research methodology that kind of trouble that insider outsider. And for example, I think of uh, autoethnography where uh, as an insider, you, you, you're not really an, ins well, you are an insider, but so it's kind of trouble that dichotomy of you going in and researching this particular group. So that could be a, a good methodology to, to, uh, to do, to use. And then there's also other things like participatory action research. Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of what I, I had in mind when we were like discussing decolonizing the research method. Thank you very much. Um, Sarah, would you like to add something? There were also a couple of questions in the chat directed to your own research specifically. Um, so I was wondering if you also wanted to address those while you were answering uh, the question about decolonizing research methods. Oh, um, yeah, if that's the easiest way to organize, um, I, can, I can do that and then I'll, I'll have to have a, I had a quick look at the questions, but I need to <laughs> really look. Um, in terms of decolonizing, I think it's really difficult to do that, but the, some of the issues have already been raised, like in terms of citation practice, in terms of sharing knowledge between North and South scholars and um, not kind of valorizing one kind of knowledge or epistemology above another. And also in terms of how you how you do the research, uh, for, uh, I was uh, very much influenced by Linda Tuhiwai Smith's book, which is now 20 years old, Decolonizing Methodologies. Um, and just the practices around, um, you know, what do we mean by giving voice and how do we allow for counter narratives to emerge in a research practice and to create a research practice that um, she refers to trying to create research as hope so that it doesn't replicate some of the research of the past. So such as, I don't know, the history of ethnography, for example, is a history of colonialism, observation, interference and control. So, um, you know, how do you do ethnography in a, in a manner which is not kind of replicating this sort of top down approach? And how do we engage in um, what my supervisor, Yasmin Godinaratnam, refers to as empirical humility? So, to, to try and do research that's less extractive and to engage in other knowledge. And, and in particular, in relation to migration, there's the whole crisis narrative and I think through uh, linking the connections of the past is, is really valuable and 
you know, decentering and reversing the kind of Eurocentric lens. So the research um, that Laura mentions and, and, you know, much, much migration is actually south to south and yet it's presented quite often as a, as this crisis of Europe, which is actually a minimal, as, as all the speakers have been pointing out, a minimal amount of movement. And the whole thing of my, migration as a problem and our role as researchers is not feeding in into that you know like the, with the way in which the figure of the migrant is constructed how do you do that as a researcher so you don't feed in into that and draw on um different knowledge practices sorry that was a bit waffly but um okay uh in terms of the questions uh how will brexit affect the uk's policies on unaccompanied minors to be honest i haven't really been working on the uk for the past Four years because I've been focusing on Italy and um, Brexit's just generally a mess and undecided but I believe it impacts more upon family reunion uh, because it will be much more difficult for unaccompanied minors in Europe to uh, access the UK. Uh, the UK has pretty restrictive policies for unaccompanied minors anyway uh, and generally returns or makes people uh, irregular after the age of, of 18 so um, yeah I'm afraid I'm not that uh, that au fait with with that argument um, uh, how is the denigration of immigrant childhood integral to the rejection of immigrants um, so I think my uh, I, I'm not sure if I've misunderstood the question, but in relation to my research, the, it's the value of childhood um, that gives and the deservingness, the vulnerability of a child that gives a migrant the right, to, an unaccompanied minor, the right to stay in Europe. The problem then becomes when they become an adult and they become the folk devil threat and, in, and the state is no longer obliged to, to host them. So it's a form of uh, temporary hospitality and, and a kind of false morality. Uh, in my research, I do look at kind of how the construct of a child as vulnerable, passive, incapable being is also relates uh, very often to kind of um, colonial mentality uh, around colonial subjects who were portrayed as childlike and uh, incapable and as opposed to the adult rational uh, subject uh, or the colonizer um, so I think that that's quite an important element and then also the whole notion of, of uh, childhood is a socially constructed con uh, concept which is uh, you know we've been recognized for years in childhood studies but then when you come to migration because you have these rigid binaries and these restrictive uh, racialized policies that also Maya has uh, um, spoken about, then you get this rigid binary of age reinforced and outpourings of supposed compassion towards um, children. Uh, and then that's totally lost uh, when they come become adults. So it's a kind of, um, I think other scholars have uh, raised the issue of the politics of compassion and, and what does that, what does that mean? And it depoliticizes things. Um, I think that's all the questions for me. The slides, I would uh, rather you just use the recording if that's okay uh, for my slides because uh, they're Amadou's drawings and I've agreed, when I use them, I agree with him what they're used for. So uh, yeah, if that, if that would be okay or if there was something in particular, I, I, I could share some of the references or something if, if that was what you wanted. But I think if it's recorded, you should be able to see them anyway. Um, so I think that's everything. I, I don't think the final question about weaponization is necessarily for me. I guess we'll, yeah, we'll address that to the whole panel. Um, there's also another one coming in. So I'm very aware of Zoom fatigue, uh, especially in these days of virtual uh, events and conferencing. So, um, but we keep your questions coming. We are here. Uh, the, 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 the event was scheduled until uh, three, so um, we'll, uh, we'll answer all the questions that are addressed to us. But um, I, I wanted to pass over to Maya um, and ask uh, uh, what her thoughts were on um, sort of decolonizing our research methods and how to think, uh, teach or discuss um, issues around migration refugees in a context that's trying to decolonize knowledge. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I have that much to add. I agree with a lot of what has been said. I suppose one of the questions that we should continually ask ourselves is what exactly we mean by decolonizing. And I think, I, I guess some of the speakers have sort of answered that, but I think sometimes this sort of, this term is used quite a lot in a way that lacks some specificity. Um, so I, I guess returning to that as well as thinking about what do we even mean when we're talking about decolonizing as well as thing as well as knowledge production. I think we're also talking about the material, which some people have touched on. Um, and so this isn't, I guess this isn't a directly about my own research methods, but um, outside of my research on migration in the UK, my PhD was on uh, British international um, development discourse and in the relationship between that and race. And one of the things that I found that is really widely known and has been written about, but is really widely known in the international development sector is that people who are classed as international workers. Um, so if even if you if you go abroad, if you say from the UK and you go abroad and you work in India, for instance, doing international development, you will most likely be paid more than other people who were are born or living in India who are not classed as international, who are classed as local workers. And so when we're, I don't know whether this falls under decolonizing, but I suppose if we're thinking about inequalities and thinking about knowledge production and thinking about how knowledge is valued, this is also comes down to the this material inequality, how the two are interlinked. Some knowledge is seen as more important than others, is seen as more is international generalizable and others is not. And um, I think thinking about the material there is incredibly important and if we're thinking about value. Um, and one of the things I just wanted to really quickly say that I didn't have time to as well is I suppose when we're thinking about things like um, migration and asylum, I 100% uh, agree with everything that's been said about the, where the focus often lies and that this is actually movement is, um, is, is global and is not, people are not always often moving to countries in the so-called global north. Um, but I think actually the way that that's framed shapes the debate here. And so one of the things that I would just say is that um, Lucy Mayblin, uh, who's based at Sheffield, where I'm also based, has a book called Asylum After Empire, if you're interested in these debates, it's worth reading, because what she argues is in the um, sort of mainstream refugee literature on refugees and asylum seekers, the argument seems often is, is that restrictive legislation, which was increasingly introduced from the 80s onwards in countries like the UK, that this was a result of increased numbers of people coming to claim asylum in countries like the UK. What she actually argues is that this wasn't just about increased numbers, this was about who was coming. And so whilst asylum uh, and people claiming asylum, seeking asylum, um, refugees have been great in number in the global south, though obviously you only have to look at, take a cursory glance at the history of partition in India, for instance, to know this. But the way that it's seen is that um, increased numbers of people were coming from the global south in this period to the glo the so-called global north, and this is sort of what was um, one of the reasons why increasingly restrictive asylum legislation was introduced in countries like the UK and it also across Europe. And what she argues is actually, um, she has a quote, which is that these people were were racialized because these colonial discourses of this sort of higher colonial hierarchy, whilst it shifted and changed still shapes who is seen as a threat and who isn't, as we talked about at length in this panel. And so she says that it's actually, um, it's not these people's supposed difference that is the reason why that they, these policies are, are, are introduced, but the way that they are marked as difference, this difference is produced. And so I suppose if we're thinking about unsettling some of the, um, some of the narratives around asylum migration, in, in countries like the UK is about engaging with those colonial histories to understand why it is, you know, the asylum debate that we have now, this sort of moral panic we have at this very moment, um, that that is rooted in these racialized colonial discourses of belonging and not. And so I would just sort of flag up her work as a as someone to have to have a look at in terms of um, maybe like shifting how we understand that debate around asylum in the UK and Europe. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm aware of timing and I think um, we've got a couple more questions and unless anybody else is gonna post anything in the Q&A uh, box, we'll start drawing um, the panel to a close. Um, so I would like to um, um, answer, uh, ask the panelists to anyone um, who has an answer to Rubina's question, 
um, who has do nations involved in invasion, weaponization, exploitation of developing countries and destruction of the infrastructure and lives of civilians not have any legal responsibility towards the refugees they create under international law. Um, and I guess um, I'm just going to add to that um, sort of point. Um, uh, there is an interesting refugee uh, series, um, series going on, um, exhibition going on at the Imperial War Museum in London at the moment, um, which I visited and I encourage anybody who is in London to go and visit it because, I mean, apart from the information it presents, it's, it's interesting to think about the space where it is presented, how the research projects of various universities, I mean, I remember, I think University of Birmingham is there, uh, Oxford, um, with their, with some fantastic work uh, are being summarized and uh, presented to a general audience uh, within a space such as the Imperial War Museum. So I think um, it's really interesting to kind of link the two sort of the, the war, the weaponization, the exploitation, and then sort of us creating a space where to highlight uh, questions of movement in a critical way. And um, yes, and obviously as uh, Rubina uh, sort of highlights it, you know, where the responsibility lies uh, um, under the sort of international law. So whoever wants to feel free to answer that question, please raise, <laughs> I'll pass over to Laura. Yeah, I can uh, speak something, say something about that. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the Imperial War Museum conference or uh, exhibition because I was um, involved in the advisory panel of that exhibition. So I had a lot of, of really interesting front row seat to thinking about how the, that those narratives that you see when you visit it were actually constructed and what were the messages that um, that the museum wanted to get across, which I'll come to in a second. But just to take the question itself briefly, um, there's absolutely a responsibility of those who are parties to an armed conflict to um, bear responsibility for civilians affected by that conflict. But the, it, which which means that very often, um, you know, in terms of reconstruction of of areas affected by war, physical reconstruction, but also um, assisting civilians who are displaced, uh, there is a responsibility, but it there's a question about whether or not that then applies also to refugees, for instance, once they're outside the country, once they're in a safe place, whether, whether or not you can argue that that safe place is, um, is the ideal place for them, whether, you know, or even the end of their journey, uh, that's where uh, responsibility tends to um, become less clear cut, I guess. Um, well less clear cut to some, let's just say. Uh, but you're absolutely right that there is abs there's a, a responsibility on the part of parties to a conflict to take some responsibility. And that's why you see, you know, if you pick apart who's responsible or who's, who's providing the most resources for a particular migration scenario, um, you often find that those, the, the, those who, who are involved in the conflict bear some, some, um, or play a role in providing some assistance. And that can be problematic as well. I mean, if you look at you know, Saudi Arabia's involvement in Yemen, for instance, where it claims that it's um, carrying out humanitarian work at the same time that it's basically perpetuating um, the conflict itself, it's, it's really highly problematic, but anyway. Um, but the, the thing to say about the museum, and I do hope that people go see it, it's open until May 24th, I think, 19, uh, 2021, um, is, that it does try to break down the, the story, the experience of a variety of different people uh, who have been on the move as a result of war. And it, I think one of its ob objectives is to try to show that displacement is a responsibility of those who carry out war. And they, they should see it as part of the story of what happens to a society that's affected by war. Um, and with ultimately the goal of how, hoping that more will take responsibility for it. But it, it does it in an interesting way. It breaks it down and along the different journeys. Um, it's very much reflective of the museum's own holdings. And so it's very focused on Europe and stories that the UK had an involvement in. Um, and we, and I was involved as an advisor trying to bring in some of those research uh, 
projects to try to broaden the story, both in terms of depth, but also in terms of geography, uh, to try to get more coverage of um, areas that the IWM doesn't normally uh, look at. So hopefully that comes across when you when you see it. But it's a it's a really interesting um, exhibition. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Um, I think, uh, Laura, you answered that question beautifully. So we'll probably uh, have one last question and use this as a kind of closing um, remarks from all the panelists. Um, and again, I'm going to um, sort of rely on our audience um, and sort of open it up also. Uh, the last question was whether you have any suggestions on how we can make the system fairer. I think all of you have very specific work on very specific um, parts, elements of this system that comes to create this uh, immigration system. So um, hopefully you'll all answer. Uh, and also maybe sort of say a few words of how, what the future of the immigration system Holds, especially in a world marked by COVID, a global pandemic, technology, um, sort of revolution, climate change, and how this is going to sort of affect um, our rethinking of movement. Is it going to solidify um, sort of borders? Is it going to create new opportunities? Um, I know it's a little bit unfair for its broadness, but hopefully it's something that you think on in your daily lives and can uh, sort of answer in relation to also your specific research projects. So maybe Laura, we'll start with you and then, or, or um, we'll go in the order of the speakers uh, that were, that presented. So you all know who goes next and uh, Maya, over to you. Um, I'm going to try and keep it quite short because there's a lot you could say um, and I suppose just to answer the question that's asked about how to make the system fairer it's like other than having not having restrictions you've said um, which would be my like ideal um, I mean I think there's a number of things you can do within the UK immigration system such as getting rid of, reducing the fees and reintroducing legal aid um, not treating people differentially in terms of the certain visa categories in which when you come into the country, you either can't claim citizenship or you aren't able to access rights that you should, I think you should be able to. So there's a number of things that could be done around that. But I think that one of the problems is that we are seeing in many ways, at least from the perspective of the UK, and so I know this is limited, a, a real hardening of not only the, the immigration system, but the, the discourse around it. And I think one of the important things I would just, Day is one of the ways that this has manifested in the past few years and, and I think this will increasingly happen is politicians in the UK warning about large numbers of people having to come to countries like the UK because of the climate crisis and this being used at once a, a reason to act on the climate crisis although that isn't actually being done in the way that it needs to be but at the same time like a strengthening of what are ethno-nationalist borders and I would say that the discussion we've had here is particularly important for understanding that because actually, although the climate crisis is very real and the way that people are being impacted now is very, very real, much of that movement is within countries, within regions, and is not to places like Europe and the UK. And this, this argument is being re reused incredibly cynically in order to help like, feed what is already a really, really toxic debate and help strengthen a very toxic immigration system and so I think as I sort of I'll end I guess as I sort of ended before which is that it's about as, as many other people have said it's about centering the border critiquing the border as actually something that needs to be dismantled dismantled as opposed to strengthened and um, I think that's where the pushback we really increasingly needs to be. Uh, yeah, so I just pick up, I guess, on climate migration as that is now the project that I'm working on. Um, and I think it's fundamentally important to stress, despite ongoing media narratives of scaremongering in many newspapers recently, as Maya said, climate, my, people who are um, induced to move due to climate change, it's essentially related to many other factors. You can't isolate out climate change and it's within a country possibly cross border to a closer country, a very, very small amount of people uh, get to travel, get overseas, essentially because most vulnerable people that get um, 
into the most difficulty and you need money to migrate. Um, we've done some work in Cambodia and that's been in just to kind of link into COVID as well. Uh, many um, Cambodians close to the border with Thailand uh, migrate across border and work in Thailand. And that's deeply problematic. And again, it's relation to migration control and migration policies and the lack of access to safe and regular channels to engage in migration if that's what you wish to do for opportunities. And so it's about creating um, safer safer ways to, to migrate and understanding how and why and what conditions people migrate. So apparently people, despite it being returned because of COVID from Thailand into Cambodia, are still returning back to Cambodia. Some are still crossing the border in extremely dangerous conditions without any access to social protection, open to exploitation, uh, because they don't have any option for earning any income otherwise. So as one of our respondents put it, the stomach is stronger than the fear. They need to migrate for, uh, for money. And we've seen the, the, you know, the way in which the Mediterranean Sea has essentially become uh, a deathbed for, for, for many, many migrants and um, completely unnecessarily. EU has spent huge amounts of money on um, border controls and it's just leading to more and more death. Uh, so fairer migration would be um, her and in an ideal world again, so it's similar to my removing these restrictions or at least allowing for greater uh, temporary forms of migration or sa safe access of migration. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll hand over to Pavine. Thank you. Um, I don't have much to add because I think uh, the panelists have uh, um, pose a lot of um, interesting um, kind of suggestions on how to make a fair uh, immigration system. But I just, um, I think the most important things is kind of reshift that narrative uh, on migration and it's not a crisis because that's often, we see that a lot. But, and I guess this is coming from um, kind of my research background is that I think it's important for us to kind of dissect what makes uh, someone a migrant because then we could see that um, it is the processes and it is the unfairness of the process that makes someone a migrant and uh, and then from there we kind of shift the the narrative and um, and also kind of imagine what is this you know, the, the current immigration system now, it created a preferable world, but not for people like me, for example, as a migrant. So it's created a preferable world for, um, so we kind of imagined uh, and speculate, I suppose, to kind of what would be a better world for people like us. And so, yeah, I think the most important step would be to kind of shift that narrative that we're having, and we see that a lot in, in, in the media. So, yeah. Yeah, I've, I guess I'm coming in next. Um, I think that the, the point's been made that we need to, as researchers, we all have a responsibility to counter misinformation and um, the mis, uh, what you might call the misassociation of different things. So, you know, yes, as Maya says, there are people on the move because of, of climate change, environmental change, but they're not necessarily moving towards uh, Europe. And that's something that the research and evidence facility has shown really clearly that when people are displaced for environmental reasons, that tends to be that they move at the very end of their coping strategies and they move to the nearest safe and sustainable place to live, which is usually the nearest city, which might or may not be outside their country of origin, but they don't have the ambition or the economic resources to travel more further afield. Uh, so th this is an example of where these different narratives get mixed together to further political ambitions here. Um, for this example here in the UK. I think things like um, the Imperial War Museum exhibition is really helpful because it reaches a new audience. Like here we all are, we're probably all preaching to the converted. We're all share a sa the same sense of outrage, but that's the audience that's gonna walk through that museum, we hope, will not be people who are used to these kinds of debates and, and arguments and are not aware of some of the data and information that we have to share with them. So. Um, that, that's what one of the things that's really exciting about it. There's a small panel in, in the exhibition that um, I took a picture of and I'm just looking at it now on my phone, 
which shows the top five countries with the largest refugee populations. All five of them have more than a million refugees uh, coming, of course, with Turkey at 3.68 million, down to Germany with, uh, with a million. And then there's a tiny little bubble which shows the UK's refugee population at 130,000. Just really small examples of, um, of representations of information that show uh, the kind of correct mis misunderstandings or misperceptions that we have about um, migration in the UK, I think, are really important to to bring out and hopefully you know that's that's certainly not the only place but that's useful i think because it's hopefully reaching as i said an audience that won't be aware of that the comparative statistic at all um and hopefully they'll take it away with them but um you know it's the same the same in, in in africa where we work you know we're trying to ex use for example uh, Uganda, which has a great, um, in many ways, has a very, very impressive refugee hosting policy to try to use that as an example for the other countries in the region to take advantage of, to try to adopt some of. It's not perfect, but it um, does, in, in kind of trying to share that method and that approach, it does try to dispel some of the ideas that um, refugee hosting, uh, that refugees pose a security threat, that they pose a, a jobs threat, a public health threat, whatever it is, to show some good examples from within the region that could be picked up in other ways. So there's a lot of different ways one can carry out this myth busting, but I think we as researchers need to work together to do a lot more of that. Uh, I guess I'm the last person here. Um, uh, uh, my take on the question of fair, how can we make the system fair? I think for me, it also raises the question of fair for whom and who makes it fairer for the others among others. Uh, for uh, my quick response here would be that uh, we need evidence-based uh, research and data to inform decision-making at all levels, either from the sending countries or the receiving countries and within the countries. And it reminds me uh, of a story of uh, uh, what one of my colleagues, uh, Michael Collier from the University of Sussex uh, one time wrote. And the issue was, I went as far as my money could take me. And the idea here was that if someone had known what it would cost to move, they would never have moved. They would have stayed in the places where they were, and then they would have uh, carried out their activities without necessarily moving across the borders to another place. So, uh, so in this way, I think uh, our take here would be to have evidence that informs the populations about what's happening, what the opportunities are among others, and then we can better respond to the questions of migration. But also the question of opportunities also requires us to look beyond just the migration bit, but to also look at the livelihoods, look at the terms of trade that we are having, such as under the WTO, among others, that can empower nation states to be able to uh, earn uh, what is their due share in terms of um, uh, development and to be able to manage the livelihoods of their host countries, among others, to better respond and also to reduce the question of who moves, why they move, the displacements among others. So briefly, that's, that's what I think would be my take on uh, fairer for whom. Thank you. Okay, so I think the panel has uh, drawn to a close. I would like to thank all the speakers for their time and for sharing their work with us. Um, I would also like to thank the audience for joining us. I mean, a lot of you have stayed for almost two hours, so just show it's, it's testament to how um, thought provoking the research that is being produced is. Uh, thank you to Stephanie behind the scenes and um, Dr. Amina Yakin, director of the SOAS Festival of Ideas for making this possible. And do look at all the other events that are taking place. Um, as I said, it's a week long uh, series of virtual events, some amazing um, research being presented. And at three o'clock, so in about seven minutes, there is gonna be a poetry masterclass with uh, 
Suhaima Mansur Khan, author of slam poetry um, book, Postcolonial Banter, and also um, co-author of the book, A Fly, uh, Girl Flies, A Guide to University. So hopefully a few of you will uh, move over to this poetry masterclass, which uh, looks very promising. So thank you all. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you.